The previous videos have looked at eutectic and paratectic reactions in phase diagrams and what kinds of T versus X curves we need to make those happen. And so this video is just going to look at phase diagrams and some of the other features that we might observe in phase diagrams. So we're going to start out looking at solid solutions and solubility in those phases. Uh, look at what happens when we have uh, many phases possible. We're going to look at line compounds and intermetallics. And we are going to look at order to disorder transformations and sort of what might happen on heating. So those are the things that we're going to look at and we're just going to sort of take a tour through some examples of phase diagrams. So let's first look at solid solutions. And sometimes these are called terminal solid solutions because they exist sort of at the end points of the phase diagram. So where we have the pure components. So we can see here on these phase diagrams that we have a single phase region over here. And so this is pure phosphorus. And we can add a certain amount of arsenic to this, really, right? So at low temperatures, we can add about 10% with the maximum amount of arsenic that can be added up to about maybe 30%. So in here we have phosphorus. This has the crystal structure of phosphorus, but it has uh, substitutional defects, really, which are arsenic atoms. So the arsenic atoms are accommodated just in the phosphorus crystal structure here. And the solubility, which is how much arsenic is allowed, increases with temperature. Now, we can look at the pure arsenic and see how much phosphorus can we add. At low temperatures, the solubility of phosphorus is quite low. As the temperature goes up, the solubility of phosphorus increases into a maximum right here, so about 15, 16 atomic percent phosphorus. That's the maximum solubility. So here we have arsenic with phosphorus atoms substituting in the arsenic lattice, right? So the we could say that the solubility of um, arsenic in phosphorus is higher than the solubility of phosphorus in arsenic. So this is, these are some of the phases that we see on the phase diagrams. These are the terminal solid solutions, and these often are called alpha and beta phase, but it doesn't have to be. Multiple solid solutions if one of the components has multiple phases possible. Here is an example of that. This is the phase diagram for aluminum and titanium and titanium undergoes a phase transformation at A82C where it goes from the room temperature alpha phase, this is HCP, to the high temperature BCC beta phase. And so we can have both a solid solution in the alpha phase down here where we have aluminum atoms accommodated in the HCP lattice and then we have a second solid solution where aluminum atoms are accommodated in the BCC lattice at high temperature. You can see that even though there's pretty good solubility of aluminum in titanium at low temperature, the solubility of aluminum in beta at high temperature is very high. In fact, it's, it's close almost to 50%, not quite, but, but pretty close. So, so beta titanium can sort of tolerate a great deal of aluminum in that structure. So we can end up with multiple terminal solid solutions if our element, and this is what's called allotropic, so it means that it has 
multiple crystal structures possible. We can also use this phase diagram just to see the wide variety of phases that are possible. So we have over here an aluminum solid solution, so the solubility of titanium and aluminum is very low. We have our terminal solid solutions, obviously. We have our liquid phase. But you see a number of other phases that are possible in here. We have the TI3AL, which has sort of a lower temperature and higher temperature phase. We have this TIAL phase that exists here. We have TIAL2 right in here. Here we have this says TI9AL23. We have this other phase up here. So there's all kinds of phases that are possible. And in order to have generated this phase diagram, you have to have had a curve for the Gibbs free energy versus composition for each and every one of these phases so that you can determine, for example, in these two phase regions, what the equilibrium compositions of each phase is at that temperature. So let's look now at our next example, which we'll be looking at a little more at the possibilities for these uh, intermediate phases. So here we have the aluminum and nickel phase diagram, and we see two distinct kinds of intermediate phases here. One of them is this wide phase here in the middle, which seems to be incorrectly labeled. This should really be the NIAL phase based on the stoichiometry. And what we see is that for this phase, and this is called an intermetallic phase, there's really a wide compositional range, right, over which this is tolerated. So this takes on an atomic structure, really, of sort of 50-50 nickel aluminum with a particular atomic arrangement. But what we see here is that it is possible to have a really wide compositional range. And so that means that we are accommodating disorder in this crystal structure. So you would have a extra aluminum sitting on nickel sites or extra nickel sitting on aluminum sites. But it is not always the case that these intermetallic phases will tolerate much deviation, basically, from the stoichiometry before they just turn into a different phase. And we see that here on this phase diagram also. So if we consider instead this Ni3Al, this phase is what's called a line compound. And essentially, it's like this, only it's so narrow that it only shows up as a line. So in the case of Ni3Al, no off stoichiometry is tolerated. So if you just get, let's say, over to this composition here. Instead, what you do is that you form Ni3Al and you form this nickel-rich phase, right? So you get phase separation into nickel plus nickel-3 aluminum. And if you go off over to this side, for example, then you get NiAl plus nickel-3 aluminum. So this has some other line compounds on it as well on this phase diagram. So we have NiAl3 as a line compound, Ni2Al3. Here we have this Ni5Al3. So this one has four different line compounds plus this one intermetallic phase where some compositional variation is possible. We can also use this phase diagram here to understand the different kinds of heating reactions, basically, that can occur. So what can happen on heating? So obviously we can have something like just pure melting, right? If you have pure nickel, you have nickel solid going to nickel liquid, right? This is just regular melting as we know it. We also can have basically a paratectic reaction going on. So with this line compound here, NiAl3, right, when this thing, if this phase heats up, sort of its ultimate fate, right, is a paratectic reaction. And, 
And it's hard to see that maybe because you don't see that sort of common triangle shape that we're used to, but that is what's happening here. So for Ni3Al, this, as it's heated up, undergoes a paratectic reaction, and it ends up as liquid plus NiAl. And then there's one other option possible, right? So we have NiAl right here, which heats up and goes directly to the liquid phase. So this reaction is that NiAl is going directly to the liquid phase. And this is something that's called congruent melting. So we see different sort of outcomes for the single phase regions on our phase diagram. In other cases, so for NiAl, if it weren't right at this temperature, it would have first gone to liquid plus NiAl and then to liquid. And that's what happens, for example, over here. It goes through a two-phase region first, and that's a possibility. So let's look at our last sort of phase diagram feature, which is the order-disorder transformation. So this is the phase diagram of gold and copper. This comes from the Springer Materials Database, which we have access to here at Boise State. And this is an interesting phase diagram. So, so we have gold and we have copper. They form, obviously, the liquid at high temperature. But then at somewhat lower temperatures, they form this enormous single phase FCC region here. So this would be colored purple if we were looking at the other kind of phase diagram. So uh, in here, copper and gold show complete solubility or complete mixing. So they're perfectly happy. You can make an alloy that has any composition in here and you won't find any phase separation. These are both FCC elements and that's why that happens. Now things get interesting though as we start to get down here to low temperature. So we have a couple of single phase regions on here and let me just color these in so it's a little bit easier to sort of follow this phase diagram. In fact we have three single phase regions on here and these are labeled with particular phase names, right? So we have copper three gold, this gold copper, and gold copper three. And the difference here is that down here, this has a very particular crystal structure, right? So the, the crystal structure of, of this phase and of this phase both look like um, an FCC structure with one type of atom on the corners and a different type of atom on the face centers. So it's not just sort of random arrangement, it's a very particular arrangement of these atoms. In the copper gold structure right here, you end up sort of with an FCC but where alternating layers are one atom type or the other. So in these low temperature phases, the atoms have sort of assigned seats, you can think of. And so this is called an ordered phase. So this is an ordered phase where the atoms have their assigned seats on the crystal lattice. And then this phase up here is the disordered phase where the structure overall looks like an FCC lattice where each site is sort of randomly occupied by a copper or a gold atom. So we observe this order-disorder transformation as we heat up at any of these compositions. So we're moving from an ordered phase at low temperature to a disordered phase at high temperature. So this just shows some of the different features that were possible on our binary alloy phase diagram.